previously on Pat the NES Punk. Eh, no one cares. Welcome to part two of my NES Black Box game review. 30 Nintendo games, lots of fun. Let's go back to the action. Mario Brothers, after Donkey Kong, the first chance for Mario to really shine as his own star. If that riff sounds familiar, it should. It's actually the intro to Mozart's Ein Klein Nach Musik, or A Little Night Music. A cultured but strange choice for an intro song. So you're Mario, and for the very first time you're a plumber, and you have to rid the sewers of a bunch of these critters, including turtles and crabs with one eye. Damn, those are creepy. Apparently, this early into his career, Mario had yet to learn how to jump on top and stomp his enemies, as doing so in this game will result in a quick death. You actually have to punch your enemies from underneath, and then run up and smack them from the side in order to get rid of them. Or if you're feeling lazy, you can smash the PAL button, which knocks all your enemies out momentarily. But if you don't kill a critter in a certain amount of time, they'll get pissed, turn a different color, and then run faster throughout the level. The gameplay is a little challenging, but I actually enjoy it. You have to build up running speed in order to make a good jump to the side, and the surface is slippery whenever you have to change direction, so it's not that easy to move around well. Mario Brothers is a classic and is definitely worth playing. If for nothing else, it gives you the introduction of Mario's beloved yet overlooked brother, Luigi. Ah, there he is in all his green grandeur. Donkey Kong Jr., the follow-up to the classic. Mario apparently has captured Donkey Kong, and now it's up to his son, Donkey Kong Jr., to rescue him. Try not to rub your eyes, but that is Mario, and he is the bad guy of this game, cracking a whip and sending the little trap jaw monsters after DK Jr. This remains to date the only game in which Mario is the villain. So your cute little chubby Donkey Kong Jr. dressed in what looks like a guinea tea, and you have to get up to your uh, papa there and save him from Mario. The gameplay has evolved here since Donkey Kong. Here you can run and jump as well, but you also interact with the environment and the level itself. You climb vines up and down, you can traverse the vines horizontally, and you can jump from the vines onto other platforms. It's a nice evolution to the series, because you're allowed to interact with the levels more. Oh, oh come on, you're kidding! Like the original, success requires patience, timing, and great reflexes, but it's not as difficult as the original, which is probably a good thing because Donkey Kong in the original is balls hard. The last level is a little different, you have to use Donkey Kong Jr. to push the keys up to unlock the cage and bring the whole structure of the building down. Look at this incredible test of strength! But besides that, it's a cool callback to the original game, seeing Mario die with a halo by his body. So what happened to Donkey Kong Jr.? Why did he disappear from video games? On Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo, it's heavily hinted that that is actually Donkey Kong Jr. from the original games. So this... became this. Donkey Kong Jr. is a classic that holds its own with the original, and I personally prefer it. Before Mortal Kombat, before Street Fighter, we had Urban Champion. Why? Urban Champion is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game where you have to protect your turf. I'd be sure to risk my life to protect the discount shop and snack bar as well. So like Street Fighter, you have a lot of different types of attacks. No wait, you have two. A body blow or a punch to the face. You can move your hands up or down the block, and the attacks come in two varieties. There's a quick punch that does little damage, or a slower and more powerful punch that will actually knock your opponent down. Unlike later fighting games, the object is not to deplete your enemy's health, but actually win the round by knocking him into an open manhole. And no, I will not make a village people reference. There's not much else going on here. You have various people who'll try to drop objects on your head in order to hurt you. But that's all the gameplay variety you'll see, unfortunately. It's just a slow and simple experience. And look at those expressions of pain. Oof. I felt that way when I played Stack Up. But at least when you win a fight, it's fun. You get this strange woman dropping confetti in the street. Hooray! Street violence! Hogan's Alley, a light gun game. And no, it's not a scary place where you might see this guy. I am a real 
but the name actually refers to a shooting range that simulates a real-world environment. Game mode A is not too complicated. You get three targets per round, and you have to shoot only the bad guys in the allotted time, which is the seconds displayed on top. It's a test of your reflexes, as well as your visual acuity. And I wish I knew what that meant. As I'm about to demonstrate, I'm an expert in both. Ah, whoops, hit the cop. That's not good. You keep playing until you get 10 misses, which occurs by either failing to shoot the gangsters, or shooting the innocent bystanders. And as much as you want to, do not shoot the old man. It starts out slow, but it gets more challenging as your time per round decreases, and you have to shoot two gangsters per round instead of only one. Game mode B is much of the same, except it's in a simulated town environment where the targets will pop out of windows and on the ground. Game B is actually my favorite mode because the moving targets make it a little bit more interesting. Why do I keep shooting that old man? Oh, check out the fancy nighttime effect. Oh, it's too tempting. Game mode C is a little bit different and a nice change of pace. It's a trick shooting game where you have to shoot cans up in the air to land on platforms for points. Awesome. Hogan's Alley kicks ass. Ah, my face is big. Tennis with its very unique theme, one that is not in all the other sports games at all. No, none. So we're playing tennis and we're serving. We're using our forehand, backhand, lobbing, smash and having a great old time. There's Mario as a tennis judge, poking his head into another game where no one asked him to. Damn, just missed him. The play control is wonky to say the least. You hit the ball okay, but just look at the incredible speed at which you move around the court. This makes it almost impossible to miss a ball that comes from your opponent. In fact, you'll probably lose most of your points either by hitting the ball out, or having the ball hitting you due to you moving so fast and not be able to get into proper position. The player's speed makes Michael Chang look like Boris Becker. <laughs> oh, oh, 1991 tennis humor. Oh. Because of this, it doesn't really simulate tennis. It's hard to get a passing winner on your opponent, with volleys lasting forever sometimes, and you'll find yourself winning your points only if your opponent just flat out misses the ball when he swings. This game would be a lot more enjoyable if they either made the court bigger, or slowed the players down. And that's about it for tennis. You can play singles or doubles, but there's no tournament mode. There's no moving on when you win or lose. It's just one game. Donkey Kong 3 and the end of the trilogy. Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. both had distinctive opening themes. This is a little weak. So you're neither Mario nor Donkey Kong Jr., you're Stanley. There's a reason you don't know who he is. He was never heard of again after this game. So as Stanley, you're in the greenhouse and you're defending your flowers from the bugs and also have to fend off Donkey Kong who hangs on the vines. You're armed with pesticide spray that you use to kill the bugs that come your way. I just rhymed like Dr. Seuss. Now you pass around either by killing all the bugs or forcing Donkey Kong up the vines and out of the greenhouse. How do you do that? Well, you just spray him with pesticide in the old pooper. Oh yeah, and the coconut in my face. Yeah, that hurt. Thanks a lot, Donkey Kong. The control in this game's a little disappointing. All you can really do with Stanley is move him left and right, jump him up, and use your spray. But the flying insects can often get behind you and around, then there's no way to hit them. You have to wait until they get in front of you again in order to spray them. Look at this, I'm totally screwed. I have to avoid the bugs, but there's no way not to get hit here. Well, the first two games in the series were unique and innovative for their multiple screens, interesting characters, and addictive gameplay, Donkey Kong 3 lacks all of that. Kung Fu, a port of the 1984 arcade game Kung Fu Master. You are Tommy, a Kung Fu Master, ahem, and you have to battle through five levels to rescue your kidnapped girlfriend Sylvia. Each level is actually a separate floor of the Devil's Temple, and even though it's a slight ripoff of Bruce Lee's movie Game of Death, eh, it's forgivable. So you tear through dozens of enemies with your trusty punch, sidekick, sweep, crouching punch, jump kick, and the ever-useless jumping punch. Seriously, why even have that move in the game? 
There's a nice variety of enemies. You have your standard thugs, who just give you a nice tight hug and somehow drain your energy. Knife throwers. And midgets called tom-toms. Oh, excuse me, little people. Each of the five floors has its own unique boss. For example, a guy with a stick. A cool magician where you can kick his head off and he doesn't die. And Michael Clark Duncan. If a boss manages to defeat you, you'll hear a nice, scary laugh. Plowing through the enemies may seem repetitive in theory, but the quick action keeps things flowing well. There's also a couple levels that have traps that keep things fresh as well. On the second level, you have snakes and fire-breathing dragons to avoid. And on the fourth floor, you have to stay away from killer mutant moths. Aww, they're so cute! In between a few of the levels, you'll be reminded what exactly you're fighting for. Sylvia bound up in a chair. Is it wrong if I get turned on by this? By the way, I'm not sure the Tom Tom should be grabbing me that low, but okay. What the hell? You sneaky little mitch little person. If you make it to the end, you'll fight with Mr. X, who's also a kung fu master, who not only can mimic your moves, he can dodge and block your attacks. Oh, he gains his life back too? He actually just blocked my jump kick. Yeah, laugh it up, fuzzball. Yeah, eat it. Alright, time for Tommy to get some sugar. Kung Fu is an absolute classic, not just for Nintendo, but in the overall gaming world. It was actually the first game in the beat-em-up genre, which helped pave the way for future games like Double Dragon and Final Fight. What else can I say on this one? Oh my god, Kung Fu kicks all leagues of ass. Beat those midgets! I mean, little persons. Slalom, a sports series game that actually has a different title theme. Way to go, Rare. You start off by choosing from one of three mountain courses. You have Snowy Hill, Steep Peak, and Mount Nasty, which sounds like it should belong in a Panesian game, actually. So you're skiing down a very long course, and you're dressed in what looks like red Long John pajamas. You also wear what looks like to be the shortest skis ever created. They barely go past the skier's boot. So you have to beat the time to keep going, and you have to do that by avoiding the trees and the other skiers that you fly by. The play control is a little iffy as you ski left and right. It's slippery and pretty difficult to actually slalom through the poles. You can jump whenever you want to, which doesn't make a difference as there's not really much to jump over besides little hills that make you jump anyway. And you can tuck to go quicker, even though it's a nice moon to us. And that's exactly how I feel when I play this game. Like someone is mooning me the entire time. As for actually doing the slalom, it really just slows you down. You don't have to, you don't get any points for missing like you would in a real slalom event. So you're better off just skipping them and just getting through the course the best you can. The later courses just get ridiculous. Besides the hills, trees, and skiers, you not only have to contend with little kids on sleds, but also snowmen even lined up in a row. What type of ski resort is this? Are you kidding me? Do those kids want to die? Oh my god, get out of my way! You almost don't want to finish the race, though, because this is why. Holy hell! It was bad enough seeing that pajama outfit from the back. Gyromite, or Robot Gyro. The name of the game is different than the name on the title screen. This must be a special rule with the Rob games. Now, I'm really not in the mood to set up Rob and play him, because half the time it doesn't work. He really does, and you got problems. But, um, you can play Gyromite with that, I mean, just need two controllers instead of one, the second one acts as Rob himself. So you're Professor Hector, and your goal is to defuse all the dynamite sticks in the level before the time limit runs out. Each level contains hanging ropes that you can climb up and down, as well as columns that get in your way. And that's where Rob comes in. Either by using Rob or the second controller directly, you can raise the blue and red columns up and down. You can do this so Professor Hector can get by, or to smash your enemies. Yeah, that probably hurt a little. You have to be careful though because you can smash yourself very easily with the columns. There's only one type of enemy unfortunately, and that's the little mutant lizards named Smix. They'll come after you, but you can grab a radish and lay it on the ground where the Smix will just chomp at it, allowing you to pass safely. For a game that has to do with defusing lots of dynamite bombs, it has a cute little song. It's a simple game that can be fun in small doses, 
But besides that, there's really not a reason to acknowledge this game too much. Well, well, I'm kidding, I really love, I love I love, I love, I love. I meant, what I meant to say was, <laughs> I love Gyromite. Alright, it's soccer. And yes, that is different music than baseball, volleyball, tennis, and synchronized swimming. Alright, each team only has five players on each side, but as it's a proportionally smaller field than a real soccer field, that's okay. Soccer almost plays like a glorified tabletop foosball game, but it's fun. Now you have to give these players a lot of credit for their flexibility. Look at those kicks! They're either playing soccer, or auditioning for a cabaret show. The gameplay is simple yet responsive. Like you would expect in a soccer game, you can dribble the ball, pass it, or shoot. Now the dribbling is a little staccato-like. You run up to the ball, you kick it once, the ball goes forward, and you follow it. It sort of simulates really dribbling in soccer, except for that galosh-stepping-in-mud sound effect it makes when you kick the ball. There's not much in terms of strategy you have to employ to score in this game. Simply pass the ball behind the defense, run up with your nearest player, get out in the open, and it's usually an easy score. Playing on level 2, I could pretty much score at will, and the computer wasn't much of a challenge. I managed to score a whopping 8 goals in one game, which, if you check on it, was actually more goals scored than all the games played in the last World Cup combined. There's not a whole lot you can do on defense. You can select the player closest to the ball, and then try to run up and kick it away from the offense. Like in ice hockey for the NES, you can control the goalie to make saves, and dive for the ball, which is pretty cool. Where soccer disappoints is the fact that you can only play one game at a time. There's no tournament mode, and it's not like you can even defeat all the teams in a row. It's one and done. Wild Gunman, a zapper game set in the old west. Game A is a showdown with one gunman at a time. He'll stroll out and tell you to fire. As long as you hit him in the allotted time, you're okay. That's all it is, basically. Even though you're not required, I'd recommend actually having to quick draw your zapper, then shooting. Or else there's no challenge at all keeping the zapper pointing at the guy the whole time until he says fire. The characters are well drawn for an early Nintendo game, and they even have a little personality thrown in. You have your standard cowboy. Your bandito. The scared guy who doesn't wear a proper belt. The city slicker. And the stereotypical cowboy with a whip. Or a purse. I really can't tell. Game mode B actually presents a little bit of a challenge and is more fun because you have to shoot two outlaws at a time instead of one. A general rule of thumb is to target the outlaw with the least amount of time allotted to you first and then shooting the second one. However, this is not always a good idea because sometimes only one outlaw will be firing at you. If you shoot one that doesn't yell fire, you get a foul and lose a life. Sneaky sneaky. Game mode C is a little like game mode B in Hogan's Alley. Yeah, I think I got that right. You have to shoot a gang in a town, and that's really about it. Although I think Hogan's Alley edges this title out just a tad bit, Wild Gunman's still a nice solid zapper game. Is that a happy face on his crotch? Not that I was staring there, of course. <clears throat> it's volleyball, with the same theme song as all the other sports games for the most part. At least it sounds a little bit punched up. I really enjoy the demonstration going on between the guy in the flat top and the guy with the mullet. Oh, wait, wait a second. The ball is not bouncing off their hands. They're bouncing the balls off their faces. Oh, what? Wait, what? Oh, I apologize for that, ladies and gentlemen. So you select a men's or women's team, but you cannot select your team's country, only the opponents. And our teams prance out to the court. It's six-man indoor volleyball, the only one on Nintendo. Is he humping the ball? So it's standard volleyball, you bump, you set, you spike. You dig, you dive for the ball, and you get blocked. Nice animation on the desperate dig right there. Now on the surface, the mechanics of the gameplay are sound. It's not too difficult to hit the ball. It's a little difficult at first to time the jump for your spike, but after a few attempts, you should get the hang of it. However, the problem comes in actually scoring a point. The defense of your opponent is beyond ferocious. Almost any ball you hit will get smacked back, 
almost any spike will get blocked. Now, there's no skill level set in this game, so this is just the standard, I guess, medium. Finally, a point! And of course, I didn't even score it. Okay, two things with volleyball. One, why is everyone hump the ball? Second, why is it impossible to score a point? Alright, I'm gonna get this one, I'm gonna get this one. And no. I could seriously more easily score a point playing against the entire U.S. Olympic volleyball team by myself. And that music is just way too happy, especially when you're getting a beating, like I am. Alright, I'm down to match point. Can I come back? Will I come back? Wait, that's from another video. Ah, uh, just forget it. Balloon Fight, part of the action series. At its heart, Balloon Fight is actually a variation on the arcade classic Joust. Except here you're placing an ostrich for balloons as your means of transportation. In the game, you float and fly around with two helium balloons, and you paddle in the air to change your direction. And, just to be safe, you wear a nice protective helmet that would qualify you to ride on any short bus you'd ever want. Like Joust, the object is to slam into your opponent at a higher level than they are at. Doing so will cause their balloon to pop and they'll float towards the ground. You have to hit your enemies a second time to knock them out completely, and you can do so either while they're floating towards the ground, or while they're on the ground trying to pump up their balloon. Your enemies will try to knock you out as well, and they'll do so by popping the two balloons you have per life. Yeah, flapping your arms will work, you'll just fly away. Besides the enemy balloon men type guys, there's also stray lightning bolts that get shot out of the clouds sometimes. What's annoying though is a somewhat random, high-pitched, uh, sound effect. What is that? Whoa, did you see that? That's a little gruesome. The balloon trip is a nice change of pace, and it's quite a challenge. Here you only have one life, and you have to just make it through an obstacle course of random lightning bolts that move in a pattern. Whoa, whoa. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> balloon Fight's a fun little game! It's Balloon Fight! Balloon Fight is so much fun! I'm floating with helium. Gumshoe. A zapper game where you have to actually shoot the guy to move him. Innovative? Maybe. Dumb? Definitely. Gumshoe actually means detective, and I'm glad I cleared that up, because looking at this character, he looks like a subway flasher if it wasn't for the pants. So the story in Gumshoe, like it matters, is to rescue your daughter from King Dom in exchange for five Black Panther diamonds. Your Gumshoe walks along at a constant speed, and it's up to you to control him by shooting him to make him jump. That's right, you shoot your character to make him jump. You also use the zapper in the traditional way, that is, shooting objects, such as cars, birds, and random flying bottles. But that makes the logic even worse. So the same gun that can destroy cars and bottles only makes your detective jump in the air when you shoot him with it? So the game fails on logic, but it also fails when it comes to gameplay. The zapper, while solid, is not the most reliable accessory. You're not actually shooting pixels, you're shooting blocks of the screen. So it's not like it's a precise weapon to begin with. Look here as I shoot the bottle coming towards me. Oh, also shot my guy who jumped up and died. Unregistered hits are not uncommon with the zapper. These factors make the game barely playable. Has anyone actually beaten Gumshoe on the Nintendo Entertainment System? Send me some evidence, not from an emulator that you actually shot your way through the game because it is next to impossible to even get past the first level. Oh Gumshoe, how I hate thee. Pro Wrestling, a game loaded with detail and personality. Well, besides having the same theme as the other sports games, well, whatever. You start by choosing from one of six colorful wrestlers. The very generic fighter Hayabusa. 
The ambiguous star man. The racist stereotype King Corn Karn. Pimp Daddy Giant Panther. The Amazon, who would later be ripped off by Capcom, it looks like. And King Slender, the good old American white wrestler. One of the first things you'll notice when you start playing is the great attention to detail that really captures the pro wrestling experience. You have a colorful crowd, ring announcers, a referee that actually moves around, and even a cameraman outside the ring. The graphics are really good considering this game is early in the Nintendo's lifespan, as both the characters and animation are well drawn and executed. The gameplay is very good. There's a good amount of different wrestling maneuvers, and each wrestler has at least one special move. For the most part, the wrestlers share all the simple moves like the punch, the overly complicated spinning Van Damme jumping kick, clotheslines, and body slams. But it doesn't end there. There's back suplexes, pile drivers, brain busters. You can jump off the top rope, and even jump over the top rope outside the ring, where you can fight as well and even throw your opponent against the barrier. Now I personally prefer to use either Starman, who has a somersault kick and flying cross chop as his special moves, or Giant Panther, who has a headbutt and an awesome iron claw for his. And that looks like that iron claw could actually be a stink palm, but we don't know. And the award for most useless character goes to King Corn Karn, who has the worst special moves in the game. His standard karate kick, and the awful Mongolian chop, which is not only difficult to actually hit, but only does the same damage as a normal punch. What's the point? There's just too many cool things going on in this game. You have to wear your opponent down before attempting difficult maneuvers like a brain buster or a pile driver, or they just get thwarted or reversed. You can throw or suplex your opponent out of the ring. Badass. There's the referee rushing over to the Amazon when he does his outlaw choke, then the Amazon pretending like he did nothing wrong. That's just cool. And of course, the seizure-inducing crowd applause when you win a match. Pro Wrestling is an outstanding black box game, and light years ahead of the other original sports games in terms of graphics, gameplay, and attention to detail. It even surpasses a lot of the other NES wrestling games, which came years later. And yes, a winner is indeed me. Well, that's it. I'm done. 30 black box game reviews. I want to thank my friends Rob, DK, DK Jr. for coming out, hanging with me. And I'll see you next time with another wacky game review.